Okay. Oh, that was a pretty good one. Uh, wake up, rise and shine, y'all. It's uh, 547. I'll call the work session. Uh, come, we'll come to order of July 6th at, 20, uh, at 2022 at 547 p.m. and I'll call the roll. Council Member Elder. Here. Council Member Bond, can you hear me? Here. Mayor Pro Tim Wheat. Here. Mayor Linda Moots here. Council Member Dodson. Here. Council Member Kelly. Here. Council Member Rigney. Here. Thank you, for everybody that's joined us. I know mm -hmm. it's at 5:30, but we had a CCCPD Crime Colorado Crime Control and Prevention District meeting that happened earlier. They're all kind of smiling because I didn't want to say it again because it's so long. But we're going to say it anyways. But anyways, we have four different things coming on the schedule or on the work session. So. We'll start with the work session number one, which is the discussion of the 2023-2027 draft CIP. Good evening, Council Larry Wright, City Engineer and Interim Director of Public Works. And we're here to talk about um, capital improvements and have some discussion. So, um, what is the CIP? CIP is a short, um, rolling five three to five year program that identifies capital projects and provides a planning schedule to include funding options. Um, the benefits of the CIP provide a link to the strategic plan and the city's annual budget, support the city's long-term goals, and focus on preserving the city's infrastructure while ensuring efficient use of public funds. So, um, these are some things that we consider the condition of the asset, risk management, long-term vision, master third fair plan, those kind of things. Available funding sources, use of assets, classification of assets, condition of and benefit of the project to the city and overall project um, final approval from the city council. So we do have a interactive website out there um, that um, we, where we show all of, all of the current CIP projects and um, once the physical 2023 projects are adopted, they will also be added to this site. So here's some of the projects that we undertook this most recent year. Um, up there in the top left-hand corner underneath um, Councilman Bond is the City Hall Library Interior Renovation Contract, which was $595,000. Um, also, we did some improvements on the Justice Center for $726,000. The Senior Center Renovation Contract Award, which you all have seen recently with some furniture and other things, is $3,431,000. And then we're um, finishing up the senior or the service center renovation for public works over there off of Hall Johnson for nine hundred fifteen thousand dollars. Which looks fantastic. Uh -huh. We all think we were, we were really good. So we also have the gateway projects, which are under contract, and um, progress is being made on them currently for eight million three hundred sixty-seven thousand, and some improvements on parks with some shade structures and some playground equipment. We also have numerous sidewalk projects that we've undertaken this last year. Um, Bandit Trail, Bedford to Cheeksparger, Blue Bonnet behind um, the Colleyville Center, Bransford at LD Lockett, Brown Trail, LD Lockett and Thompson Terrace, and we've just started the West Coast um, section here most recently. And um, later tonight, we'll be bringing you a um, professional service agreement to get Bransford Trail back underway. And we also um, have under design currently um, Bedford Road Trail with what will probably end up being some money from um, the Congresswoman and some bridge improvements there close to Sparger Park. One question on Westcote. Westcote already has a trail or sidewalk, right? Yes, so this, this section is, is south of where most of that sidewalk is currently. It stretches all the way from McDonwell School Road 
down to the south and in, um, in the vicinity of, of White Drive in that area. Oh, okay. So this is way up, way further south. But you're yes. correct. The other between the roundabouts is already got nice high box. It's, it's just the remaining just, from White to Elder Lock. Because I think there were two sections, right? We thought we'd do it all, get a bed all at one time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. A couple yeah. of sidewalks and that. It'll be it'll be great. Mm -hmm. yeah. It looks really good so far. Good connectivity. So here's some of the local street projects that we either have under design or currently in um, have been completed. So we have the local street maintenance projects 2022, which was 7.11 lane miles that was resurfaced by the partnership with us in the county for $479,000 and um, it includes all of those streets listed there. Our average network PCI was um, 82.7 back in 2017. And so with all the improvements that we've made over time, not including deterioration, we're somewhere up around 85.4. Larry, what's PCI? PCI is Pavement Condition Index. Thank you. And so, sorry about the acronym there. It's not, a, it's not a, a access to the computer? No. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, currently under construction, you know, um, with a lot of attention being um, paid to it is Glade Road Phase 2 with the roundabout. That's an Ed Bell contract for $14.273 million. And then um, we have finished up and we're just doing final closeout on Pleasant Run from John McCain up to the northern city limits, which was a three point. Two two million dollar project. Larry, if we move forward, I just want to say thank you to Commissioner Fickus for helping us out with all these projects and the county uh, giving us money to partner and have these these done. That's a big deal, and our hats off to the Commissioner Fickus. Appreciate it. So for us. working with the county gives us a, a lot of um, bang for the dollar. It sure does. About seventy thousand. Yeah, for those not it's familiar. It's really great. Uh, the county provides the labor and equipment. And we pay for the materials. We pay for the materials and design and all that. Yes. And they're very good at what they do. We're glad they're 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 so here's some highlights from some utility infrastructure stuff, projects. Um, so we have the LD Locket pump station generator um, with the, the contract at $404,000. That, that has been installed and we're um, working with um, the Texas um, Emergency Management Department for some grant funding on that one. And then we have um, Wastewater Project 5, which is also currently under construction there on Quails Path at $533,000 to um, fix up a large line that had some sags and other problems in it. Under design, we have two projects, which are Wastewater Project 18, Pecan Park Estates, and also Woodbriar Quail Crest Water Wastewater Design. And, the, and those are gonna be very large projects. Over, yes. Over a million. Yes. So now let's get into some of the, the longer term goals of the um, from physical year 2023 20, to 2027. 20, um, these pro programs identify projects planned over the next five years based on funding availability and a schedule for completion. The capital improvement project provides an opportunity to consider all of the city's capital needs in these coming years and determine priorities for each of those. So up there underneath George, we have some um, drainage projects and I'm gonna have to turn to that page just so I can. So we have drainage improvements for 300,000. That's just citywide. That's um, stuff we normally have in the budget that we use those funds as, as issues come up. And then we have Old Grove Pond um, beautification for 100,000. Um, 50,000 of that money is provided by the, the contractor in the recent plat approval that you saw. And then we have the South Gateway development um, design down there um, close to Cheeks Parker, where 
Um, there's a considerable amount of water that comes off of State Highway 26 under State Highway 26, and then all of that water flows through um, that site. And so that totals 475,000 for those drainage projects. Over in facilities, we have a whole list of projects. Um, Loja Fountain, um, Fire Station 3 Rehabilitation, the Emergency Generator up on Overland Trail, um, Senior Center of Renovations um, for next year is $1.1 million, but that's a much larger project overall. Question on the Fire Station 3, what, what, what does that involve? The, I'm not sure the entire scope of it, but I know it's roofing, bathroom remodel, flooring. Um, okay. But the majority of the interior, not the kitchen. The kitchen's being... Yeah, the, we put new doors in and then, last yes, year, right? The bay's done. The flooring in the bay's oh, done. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Cool. So yeah. it's, it's other... It's okay. exterior and some interior. Great. Right. Are you getting your own private bathroom like the other chief does? Or no? I don't warrant that. I'm not that special. Oh, you're not that special. Okay. I was just curious about that bathroom remodel. So total on facilities, we're spending $2.375 million. What's hey, the Larry? Logia Fountain? The Logia is outside the library. That is in, it, it, that, uh, the condition of the stone work and the, the sill and everything else down there is, is in need of repair. And so at the same, while we redo that, we can then also deal with some of the water elements. Most notably, the water elements in the past have been related to the fact that the collection pool at the bottom is too small. Right. And so now the collection pool has been aged and it has been beat up a little bit by skateboarders and BMX riders. It's a, it's a good time to try to replace that. And I try to go on the record as saying the bathroom was there before Chief Miller was there. <laughs> <laughs> We're giving Chief a hard time. Oh, so down in the IT technology department, we have security cameras for the parks in 2023. We've had some vandalism occurring here lately, and that's a hundred thousand dollars. So we have some master plan studies. We have the Northern Gateway flood study. So um, as we make improvements up there and sell that property up there, some portion of that um, property up there has been declared as floodplain by FEMA. And we'll have to work with and around the designers of, of that property to make sure that we don't have a negative impact on the floodplain up there. And under PCI, Pavement Condition Index, we'll have an assessment next year to update those numbers because those numbers are, are five years old now and we need to make sure that we stay on track and have numbers that are providing us um, current and relevant information. Under Parks and Recreation, um, which Lisa was here to talk about all of these projects. We can talk a little bit about it. We've got obviously the big thing is the splash pad discussion um, and then obviously the other big one is that there's talk about renovation of multiple park sites with some uh, recreation equipment either being replaced or being installed. And so we were very generic about new park amenities being uh, simply applied uh, across uh, multiple parks. So we didn't want to go site specific. And then also the big issue is the Heroes Park renovation. We kind of want to pick up that discussion again and bring that forth. And so there's talk about just some initial money for design, but there's obviously a major cost involved depending upon the degree of improvement that's undertaken. Absolutely. One of your important. recent discussion was wayfind signage, which is down there at the bottom of this right. yeah. as well. Yeah, the splash pad is a big deal uh, as far as uh, maintaining it and making sure that the water uh, remains uh, not polluted because I've, I've heard you know lots of stories of other uh, splash pads where uh, actually children, I, know, I think some died yeah. because of the, the bacteria. But we, we do testing on ours quite often. Um, every month, I think there's, or every week, there's somebody out there testing. There's twice a week. And then also our crews do it. We also have an infrared filtration system on there. We have a system that 
will automatically immediately drop that uh, much needed, if it's chlorine or whatever, to start to uh, sanitize the water right off the bat. And if it doesn't make that sanitation, it immediately shuts off completely. So we don't want, I know there's that thing in Arlington and there's been questions about it. Colleyville's on top of it. We are state of the yard on top of this. And we took, took key to that warning and uh, we made the best of it. Between our staff, the contractor we used to test and the technology is pretty much monitored 24 hours a day. Yep. That's great. So when they step in there mm -hmm. and it's running, well, it doesn't run 24 hours a day, right? Well, the, the testing, I mean, 24 hours. He's saying, yeah. Test. Every day. Yeah. And anything you build would be stated there with the newest technology. Right. Sure. So we also have um, sidewalks and streets on site for next year. We have 550000 for the annual sidewalk connectivity projects, which those are sidewalks that are recommended by the sidewalk connectivity committee. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the Brantford Road Trail construction, Field Street to um, Cotton Belt Trail, the parks to up there by the um, Web House. And that's one million seven hundred fifty thousand. And then over on the street sides, we have a lot of projects there as well. We have um, Sheiksparger Road, um, which is currently under construction all the way from State Highway 26 over to Sandbar. Um, we have the Jackson Road Bridge renovation construction, which that'll be a TxDOT undertaking at $1.2 million. But we also have some work that we'll have to do to facilitate that work with um, some minor um, sewer and water line relocations there at that location. Right. Currently, that water line's on the bridge, and we'll have to take it off the bridge to facilitate that, right. that construction. We have a John McCain bridge expansion just west of um, West Coast and John McCain Road, there where the traffic circle is. That roadway kind of narrows down and zigzags a little bit awkwardly. And so we have a federal grant to um, facilitate that reconstruction. We have Roberts Road and we have Tinker's Road that are currently both in design with um, working with Grapevine and then on Tinker Road, we're just finishing up the design to make sure that we don't have any big issues there. Those are the big projects. We have a million dollars in our normal street maintenance program and, and 100,000 in our street marking for a total of $7.8 million. It, is the 2.7 include, include, includes the road reconstruction? Yes. Well, in that case, it's, it's, it's basically not a reconstruction. It's a uh, mill and overlay. Yeah, mill and overlay with the county is where we're planning to go. Storm water, right. the whole project. We're, we're actually going to bid it as a contractor does the road, and if that bid comes in too high, we're going to then use the county to do it. Okay. So Good. with the county, when you when they when you, you assign that road to them, you lose the chance to add other roads, and so we want we're curious to see what the cost differential would be. Anyway, but we're convinced that the county is going to be the better way to go. Great. Okay. I'm sure they are. On that John McCain Bridge, is that going to be expanded like north or south or both? Because I, I I know exactly where it's like Actually, the road's wide. larger and it gets smaller right there. That's where some cars have flipped. Am I right? So the John McCain Bridge, bridge. yes, it mm -hmm. will get most likely wider and will change the alignment slightly to take care of both of those issues. Um, we have very narrow right of way through there, so there'll be some right of way acquisition as well. That's not going to go into the. There's a path right there. So not on the south side, okay. yes. Okay. And there's some discussion later tonight about that as well. Okay. Start the engineering. So we, we have some vehicle replacements. The vehicle replacement total is $200,000. Over in um, Terra, we have some issues where there seems to be some wastewater getting into, or some storm water getting into our wastewater lines. We need to correct that because we have to pay TRA to treat that storm water when we shouldn't have to be. Yeah. Um, and then we have some Woodbriar Quails Crest for 3.3 million and Wastewater Project 10, um, rehabilitation of um, some priority manholes there as well. And that's a feature of our brand new tractor down the facility. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say that's a they little wish. stylized, but yes. It's a lot smaller.
And so now we're getting into the finance and that kind of stuff, and Kyle's the expert here, so I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Thanks, man. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Kyle Lester, Finance Director. Um, so the funding sources uh, in our capital improvement plan do vary. Um, the largest comes from available balance that's sitting in mostly our capital projects fund. Uh, we do plan on utilizing some balance in our CEDC fund when appropriate, uh, and a little bit of our excess balance in our general fund as well. Um, uh, we will utilize any grant opportunities um, in any areas that we're able to, uh, to tap that source, as well as any special revenues that qualify, such as voluntary park and library contributions, and uh, parkland dedication fees as well. Uh, our utility capital projects rate will be set to the funding level that, uh, needed. Uh, at this time, however, no increase is required going into 2023, so that rate will, will stay the same as it is in this fiscal year. Uh, and of course, any uh, decision on new drainage rates will be incorporated here as well. Um, so this is a snapshot of all of our capital funds that are at play. Uh, and the projected fund balances that they're going to have throughout this five-year forecast. Um, all balances are projected to remain positive. Uh, overall, we do plan to spend down to about $15 million by the end of 2023. Uh, and staying in a TV real quick. The part that's blocked up in the left is the CEDC. So it's yeah, the okay, CEDC and then Capital Projects Fund. Yes. So that's the one. Uh, so we'll stay around fifteen to, to $16 million, somewhere in that range. Uh, until we hit those out years uh, and some of the projects start to taper off a little bit here. Um, again, silver lining, uh, we do not plan to use debt financing. Uh, this would be all done with cash on hand. Uh, and that really requires uh, substantial interfund uh, inter loans, uh, which we've been doing for and planning on for a number of years now. Um, uh, the general fund's going to come into play a little bit here as well. Uh, at the end of this year, we'll move uh, all of our general fund surplus, uh, including uh, predominantly spillover from the second payment in our federal ARPA funding, uh, into the general capital projects fund. Um, I do plan on continued use of available general fund balance as needed, um, taking care to ensure we remain above that threshold of 100 days um, uh, of a balance in our general fund. Uh, but of course, this uh, depends on how quickly those projects uh, get going. Uh, but we'll be ready to utilize that if we need to. Uh, for now, I anticipate about $1.5 uh, million transferring from the general fund into capital projects fund next year. Uh, as I said, that's going to depend completely on, on how quickly these projects get going. Uh, and then utilize as needed uh, throughout the, uh, the out years there. Uh, again, uh, we will make sure we remain above that 100 days uh, threshold that we've set. So, Kyle, real quick, I was going to I just passed out, because what, um, in your packet you have a copy of the large spreadsheet, which basically takes all of those funds Kyle referenced, and all of the projects that have been referenced by Larry, and kind of reconciles it together to show how each project is funded from multiple funding sources. And so just for, um, you know, and then you also have, go back uh, two slides. You also have that nice table that shows the fund balances in each of the funds. And so just for uh, presentation purposes, uh, Kyle put together this little uh, quick spreadsheet, this little table. And what this does, it looks specifically at only the Capital Projects Fund, which is right under Councilmember Bond on the screen. And it looks at it and combines it with grants because that's they're, they're, they're tied very closely together. And it goes in and says, okay, how does the revenue look? How does the expenditures look? And then... What is this uh, transfer discussion that you heard talked about a little bit, and how does that incorporate? And you can see in each of the years, the uh, ending balance is in line with what was presented in this simple table, but we can provide any of these more detailed. You know, you've got everything from the very simple, which is on the screen, to a little bit more detail, which is in your hand, to every detail, which is on the large spreadsheet. And the idea is this kind of provides you every which way to reconcile and to kind of see how it goes. But one of the things I think that's important is in this document that I passed out to you, you'll notice in the transfers in yellow, um, each year that transfer amount is different and some of it involves a substantial amount transferring back from the TIF that the TIF borrowed from this fund. But you'll also notice there's a surplus amount in 24 it's 600,000, in 25 it's 550, 
uh, then 300, and then 150. That's the end year end anticipated surplus that would ultimately be transferred and spill over into the capital fund. And you can see those are pretty conservative numbers, given the fact last year's surplus was 1.75 million, and this year should be somewhere similar. And so this is in an effort to show you that we're applying very conservative projections going forward. Um, you also notice that the new CIP revenue on the top is 250. That implies the $2 that was talked about. And so we're trying to apply very simplistic but very conservative numbers to this so that we're protecting the five-year uh, scenario. And earlier today, we talked about the CCCPD potentially taking on vehicles from uh, sending vehicles over to CIP. Well, that amount was about $200,000. Well, you can see in 25, 26, and 27 when that would occur, that fund is more than adequate to handle that. Absolutely. And so this is all part of that bigger picture strategy. But if you ever want to see it broken down in pieces, you know, we did this just for CIP for today's purposes, but we can do that in any of these funds. Some of them don't have a lot of activity because they're funds that are just sitting waiting for a specific project like Voluntary Park Fund or a Voluntary Library Fund. But they're, they're, we can do that for any of these. And so if you need that, please let us know. We'd be happy to provide them. Uh, thank you. If there are any uh, further questions or comments, uh, happy to address those. I think just one more question, one point. Go back one more time, and just the only thing that's worth mentioning is um, the one more, one more back. The fund, of course, that's hidden behind consumer bond uh, is the CEDC. You can see the CEDC has substantial fund balances, and so that's in addition to its operating, which is obviously you know taking the revenue collected from sales tax <coughs> and then funding the expenditures in the park and library programs, and then uh, any surplus then going into that fund balance. And so that's a substantial fund balance. And so, you know, discussion about that could include maybe identifying a specific project like Heroes Park and saying that's a project we want to earmark some of this funding for and identify that specific project in a specific amount to draw down that fund balance as well. That'd be yeah. fantastic. Yeah, sure. So there's different, what I'm, my point is, there's different ways you can utilize these funds. And so ideally, you'd love to utilize it for one time only expenses so that you don't have an ongoing expense that is being funded with a one-time revenue, but you've got a lot of options available to you. I'm glad you keep bringing up Heroes Park, because that was one of our uh, priorities that we thought was really needed here in Colleyville, and uh, we'll be looking to put it together committee later on, and uh, maybe really starting to exercise and getting this thing funded, and I'm glad you brought that up. Well, you so you the you could use it either way. I'm just showing that there's a funding source that's that's available for it, okay. and so you could earmark it where it's an easy connectivity between CEDC, which is parks and libraries, and a public park program uh, location that is uh, in high esteem in the community, and, and so you've got that connection if you okay. wish. Great. Fantastic. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I guess we're going to move on to the work session number two, which is discussion of updates to fees and charges. Back to the money man. All right, thank Mr. you again, Mayor and Council. Uh, Kyle Lesser, Finance Director. Uh, this item should be pretty short. We don't have a lot of recommended uh, changes to our fee schedule for FY 2023. Uh, but I, we do have some minor uh, changes to, to get through. So the first one we'll go over is in our library. Uh, this is pretty simple. Uh, we've been, we're proposing to remove library late fees. Uh, this is something the library board has uh, unanimously agreed upon uh, as well. Um, additionally, surveying uh, libraries in the area, there's really only one other library in our area that still charges late fees. It tends to be a, a, a national trend, in fact, to remove those. Uh, from a financial standpoint, we've already incorporated that into the FY23 budget. Uh, that was uh, a reduction of about $6,000 uh, in revenue. Uh, nothing particularly substantial. Well, well that, so if we will lose six thousand, but we may actually gain it in uh, in the management of it. In other words, I, I wonder what the impact is. Uh, or sure. Ease associated yeah. reflection. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a, I that's wouldn't a, think. I think they would be minimal. But, but what, what happens we, when they don't return the the, the Material. That's, we, uh, we go after them to right. collect it. Right? Send chief and uh, so a nice letter. assistant chief. Oh, they, they go after <laughs> he this. He said no. Okay. Books are important, <laughs> chief. 
Um, you know, I, I imagine they're going to lock down their account so you can't read it, rent anything or uh, check right. anything else out. Absolutely. They're enforcing that. Please, 25 bucks. We're sort of more moving in that direction already. So we have automatic renewals. Um, until it, so you, if you have a book checked out, it is automatically renews until someone else places on hold. Okay. And then you, know, so you have to turn it back in. So it's, we're already kind of trending in that direction. Okay. Good. Uh, the next fee to uh, to consider here is uh, removal of uh, our um, uh, alarm fees, uh, home system alarm fees here. Um, again, this has been incorporated into our, our budget. Uh, we had in the past uh, received about sixty-ish thousand dollars into the general fund from this, um, but again, we're uh, we've incorporated that into our budget. Uh, and, uh, How much does it cost to? Yeah. Just How much are we paying to collect it? Well, the problem is that there's a collection, uh, there's a firm that does collection. They I send know. letters out to residents. They collect and keep a portion and send us a portion. But as we can understand, they really don't do anything except for collect the record and keep the record updated. And so our thoughts are we should be able to do that internally ourselves. And so who's the key holder to that alarm? Who's the owner of that home? Technology has advanced enough. It's much easier to find out than maybe it was in the past. And this is a throwback to a time when it's just an inconvenience for our residents that doesn't really serve a purpose. Yeah, yeah, that, that's my reaction. Residents are paying $25 a year, plus though they're paying a fee when there's an alarm call. So if you have a false, after so many false alarms, then there's yeah, a fee and they bill it directly, yes. And so there's a lot of revenue generated on that, mostly on the false alarms, Right. more so than the uh, the, the structure, but how many false alarms do you get? Because I haven't gotten a bill, so <laughs> well, I'm hoping, saying, yeah, as a I'm hoping I'm still under. The homeowner association I belong to paid a lot <laughs> over the <laughs> house. I saw all this, but because there's a clubhouse that somebody keeps setting the alarm off. But uh, I think the problem is dependent upon how bad it is. The, the and so a lot of these are commercial businesses too, so they may sure. have ongoing problems. But it, it it is a problem, but usually it rectifies itself, so it's not an ongoing problem. So that would no, there would no longer be a fee necessarily associated with that. Well, what would happen is we'd have to probably pass an ordinance that establishes okay. a fee okay. if our current ordinance doesn't cover it. And then our police department, after so many calls, would then uh, bring that up as probably either through code enforcement or some other action where they okay. issue a fine through that ordinance and say, okay, business owner, you have not corrected the problem where it's becoming a nuisance for the department and drawing on our time and resources. We're going to find you if you don't correct it. I bet your new software can handle this. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> but our goal is not, our goal is always compliance. Right, you don't right. want to find anybody. Right. And the, uh, the final fee that we're seeing changes on, it would be our Colleyville Center uh, rental fees. Um, <coughs> the uh, increases will be from our Saturday uh, weekend rate going from 3000 to 4000 uh, And Friday and Sunday rental rates from 2500 to 3000 our nonprofit discount would still remain in place. Uh, in fact, the uh, proposal is to increase the discount on Saturdays from 20% to 50% uh, discount, and Friday and Sunday discount would, uh, would continue to remain at 50% as well. Uh, the reasons behind these changes uh, are really involving inflationary concerns uh, over the next few years. Um, additionally, uh, the center staff uh, did conduct a um, uh, rate and service study uh, that determined that these changes were warranted uh, given the market. Uh, and the advisory committee has uh, signed off on these as well. Mr. Mayor, did you want to talk about the Council kind of Center fees for some of the local nonprofits? And yes. Um, so you guys know that uh, very soon we'll be talking about uh, charitable organizations that have come in and asked for money and this and that. And I think that we have some very via, uh, valuable organizations here in Colleyville, like the Lions Club, the, uh, the uh, CEO Club and stuff like that, that actually go out and do things in the community. And what I'd like to see us do is to give them some type of credit to use the Colleyville Center whenever they need it on Saturdays or a meeting or this or that. It's, instead of, you know, handing cash back out to those guys uh, and then just uh, circulating, that they'll be able to come up and use these uh, facilities for free. Uh, so with yeah, the credit. I think, I think what I hear and hearing you say is when they come and help at um, community events, we would give them kind of credit for that. that they right. have been used, yeah, which I think is an outstanding idea. I mean, we have the breakfast for Santa. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, sure. they should be able to use that. And then their meetings or this or that is be able to, I mean, they, they give so much to the community. I feel like it's warranted to these 
nonprofit organizations that Colleyville holds dear to our hearts. So. The other option you've got is you could you could do it that way, or you could also just as you do the charitable events, you you allocate an amount of money. Right. You could just at the same time say these five organizations are allocated five thousand dollars worth of free rental time at the Colleyville Center, and then Leslie just carries it on her books as an in kind. And so uh, there's you know so so you're not really giving them cash, but you're giving them that time at the Colleyville Center, and then that way you have that ability to look at it every year because it's part of that listing when you do all the rest of them. I'd really like for us to focus on char uh, charities that are here in Colleyville. Not that the other charities aren't valuable, but why not help those that are here in the community that are actually making a difference in Colleyville. And, so, and the reason why we, we wanted to avoid going, because your point is well made. Well, hey, they come out and work an event. Why don't you just give them credit on that? The, the, the one thing we have is we have some groups that come out to a lot more events right. and work those events. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to get a win-win out of it, like the Lions Club working at the Stars Guitars. I think we, we buy the material and we give them like $500. And they come out and work and they give out free hot dogs and the, the sauce done a stick. Right. But it's the Lions Club, which is great. They're about, they got a boatload of volunteers out there. Mm -hmm. We're giving them five hundred dollars. We're buying the supplies, but it's great value for our community. Sure. The other vendors out there who are selling their product, they're not paying us. They're not. They're not benefit. They're benefiting the community that they provide a service, but they're not put, reinvesting back in the community. Right. Agreed. And so we kind of want to keep the two separate because those that are going to volunteer, like the Lions, were at our, uh, our our cleanup day. Right. You know, they were they were obviously here. They were at the car. So they're they're at multiple events. And so if those kind of groups want to do that, great. We can give them a donation for that. But this would be more of, hey, get the Garden Club, get the uh, maybe you know Rotary, get all the, the CEO, all these groups to take Colleyville Center and make it their home and, and stay there. And so they've got an identity with Colleyville already. Let's reward that. I like that. It's great. And you guys could decide who those organizations are as part of that listing when we do the annual. I have a question, Kyle. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm I'm surprised that that we're not seeing. Uh, you know, changes for inspections and community development. Yes. And uh, one that I was interested in when I went through it uh, was a response to gas leaks. Uh, we're, we're charging a very small amount for, yes. uh, you know, having a police stay there for a day. I think it's $15 an hour, something like that. Have, has there been a review? And and also, you know, the inspections and so forth. Yeah, every year the reviewed. departments have to review all of those. Most of the gas leaks that we have um, are literally, literally they're, they're, they're service-related, home-related, okay. and they turn them off. And luckily, our inspectors have stayed late to make sure those people are back on, because usually it's the coldest time of the year and a homeowner's impacted. Right. But we haven't had a real big demand for a lot of these. Um, the one we probably should really look at is related to the transition again we talked about to renovation permits and rehab permits versus new construction and so we're continuing to monitor that as we transition away from traditional new construction to rehab um, but this year when the community development department looked at they didn't suggest any um, eddie wilson our building official is is retiring and so we're gonna be having a new building official coming on and so that individual probably won't be here for the you know till 45, 60 days, but when they come on, one of the things we'll ask them about is that kind of thing. But we really didn't see anything major other than that transition. So the dilemma you have is when you when you increase the rehab fees and you increase the the, the little permits, you know, for garbage disposal and that kind of stuff, you, you don't want to create too much of a fee there because those are impacting the existing homeowner as much as the new homeowner who was rehabbing. Right. And so we're trying to strike that balance, and I think you guys did a good job. Was it two years ago we had that discussion, I think? And so we can look at that again uh, this year and next year. Yeah, the reason I'm, the reason I'm wondering is I, I think we, we reviewed them three, or you know, made some pretty significant changes about three years ago. Yeah, we had two or three. I'm surprised. Yeah. I mean, you know, with inflation, obviously our labor costs have gone up. No question. Yes, and at that time, we really had a discussion about the transition from new construction to rehabilitation of existing, and um, the idea that the community development department is trying to pay for itself, and we really, at some point, are going to have to revisit that and talk about the 
there, there's a there's a general belief that our rehab price per square foot is low, but I think that was purposeful. I think the council's discussion was, hey, we don't want to penalize existing right. homeowners who are improving their property. Right. And so we were able to sustain that. It wasn't a big financial hit to us. And at some point it may be more of a conversation, but it hasn't gotten there yet. But it's a fair it's a fair thought for a future date. Eventually we're gonna to have to because we're gonna to have to make up that difference that new construction no longer is providing. And so you can see the community development revenue decline over the last, you know, couple of years. It's been not as bad as we had thought, um, but it's it's definitely when you don't have a lot of new homes to build, you definitely are going to see that decline. Sure. And we just don't have the available space anymore for new development. Yeah. Which may also change some staffing, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it may not only change the number of people, but it changed the way those people operate. Exactly. And so they're more in, in service yeah. and less in inspection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, we'll go to work session number three, discussion review of the City Council Rules of Procedure. I think everybody has their packet. And Ms. Christine, let's go do that. Good evening, Mayor Council. This provides for a discussion of your City Council Rules of Procedure. I printed out for you uh, what was in the packet for suggested uh, changes. And we can go through it page by page. Most of these are really inconsequential. It is just trying to reaffirm and make sure that we have covered all of our, our bases. On page four, under the meetings to be public, we had excluded uh, executive session, obviously. And we also, while we post for the goals and objection, uh, not objections, objectives for session, uh, we don't really receive public input. So. Uh, the thought is to is to add that to not being a public meeting. Well, I mean, is there any reason that it that can't be public for people to to attend? I would say there's probably no reason that it couldn't be. We we post, and however, it would interfere with your consultant talking to you about your priorities and what you want to see happen. I think it would potentially take away from the process. Yes. You wouldn't feel as free, I think, right. to have the, well, the in discussions. The past, in the past, uh, and this was done in 2016, right. they, they had a work session up in Southwood. Right. And I sat in on it, and it was interesting to me to see. And that was, and, and honestly, Councilmember Dodson, that was the first time that that had occurred. All other visioning sessions had been just staff and council. So, I, this last one was. It, right, and so it's not necessary that you put it there. That's just a, something for con consideration. So on pages six and nine, and this would be, uh, this would be something that I feel that you all would want to truly talk about is um, having our council meetings start at 7 as opposed to 7.30. And if you do choose to do that, these are the two places that that would change. All of these items, as you consider them uh, in direct staff, will have to be done by resolution adopting your new rules of, of procedure. So those are certain. This is certainly information to uh, discuss and, and direct staff as to whether or not you want it to come forward in a resolution. So we're not going to talk about that? No, you certainly can and you can direct staff if that's... Okay. And Christine, the thought here was to shorten executive session, not to change anything else. In other words, the executive session um, is... 30 minutes. Yeah, make it 30 minutes instead of the, the hour. You oh, could. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. If you guys think that's, I think it's good time. idea. I'm good because we just have to be finished like right now at six thirty to finish, and then our executive session thirty minutes well, yeah. to start. Like a day, night like tonight, we would have to. Yeah, the other option is you could short. Well, you could shorten. Your meetings can go long; they just can't start early. <clears throat> so if you have a, 
you can always start late, you can't start early. So right. if you have a seven o'clock timeline uh, for the start of the meeting and the executive session wants to start at 6.30 and you have nothing on the executive session where you have nothing planned and at 6.30 you can continue on. Or we could also close the work sessions at uh, you know at an earlier time. They can close at 6.15, they can, you can do whatever you want, we can push times back. The question was, do we start the meeting at 7 instead of 7.30? And then from that, then what does that mean as far as how we schedule it? Yeah. Yeah. The thing it might mean is some, some slightly earlier work sessions. We've or done we, that anyway. It's true. And if we ran late in work session or executive session, that just means the meeting time would start after right, 7. Right. Sure. You would start late and start early. Yeah. And you always have the option of recessing executive session yeah, and coming yeah. back after. So going sure. at the end of your meeting. So try not to do that. Right. <laughs> so those are viable options right. to you as well, if that's what you so choose to do. And so um, page seven, the presid uh, presiding officer. Uh, this is one final tweak is because we had said that the most senior um, council member after the absence of, of the mayor or the mayor pro tem. And... Uh, Seeing that we're on staggered terms, right. uh, we have to somehow identify who that next person would be. So or by maybe last by name. age, I would do that to any of you. <laughs> so that's just just a, a thought there. And page thirteen, um, as you're aware, we had had several different work sessions regarding applications for boards, commissions, and committees. The accepting for a year and having to go back and recall those people and ask them whether or not they wanted to, to continue to be considered, uh, we weren't getting we weren't getting enough applications. Not doing individual advertising uh, periods, so this is more at the request of the city secretary's office. Is that we go back to actually advertising and accepting during the specific terms that are coming up. It became very confusing. We would go yes. back and we'd find all other stuff that had been there, and then we, as we start going back again, we found more, and it, yeah. it just became really confusing. And yeah. typically, people were being appointed to a committee, but we allowed them to choose three, and so maybe they were appointed to their third choice, and now, so then you've got them stacked in serving on more than one board commission or committee, and it, it became confusing to them as well as to staff. So that, as I said, that's a request of the city secretary's office to try and make it better. And then uh, recently you had made appointments uh, of city council liaisons to several of the board's commissions and committees and you want to consider for the Chamber of Commerce and Independent School District and any other organizations. So this would be our suggested wording at the discretion of the mayor or by call of three council members. A council member or council members may be appointed as a liaison representing the city to a city board commission or committee, the Chamber of Commerce, independent school district, or other organizations. So this would be administrative only. It would be provided for in your rules of procedure, but would not require a separate resolution as we do those, um, even on consent, for appointing your yeah. council liaisons. And then obviously... Uh, depending on how you direct staff, all of the administrative changes that would be need to be made for proper numbering and noting on the index of changes would be updated as well. So I don't know if you want to stop and discuss that or I'll go on to this. Oh. You guys have any questions? No. Anything in there that gives you heartburn or concern or any thoughts or ideas? Okay. So if you want staff to go forward with that, we can certainly put a resolution on the next agenda with, with those corrections. Okay. And then um, here's some items to think about. And, and for us, I think it will, it, we, we have to do a kind of slower transition, but uh, consideration of moving to a consent agenda and not just a consent resolution. So a consent agenda is that everything is approved under one motion, with the exception of um, our ordinances, and then you would move that to a regular 
item because they require two reads. So several of our surrounding uh, cities do this. I have done a great deal of research with uh, the city of, of Allen in this regard. Their uh, charter almost mimics ours, as do their uh, rules, uh, rules of procedure for their council. So they typically start their meeting at 5 and they're done by 7. Uh, so obviously it enhances uh, the public's interaction uh, with council when you do that. Still provides for um, staff to be there if you want an update. The, the agenda packets would continue to remain the same. You would still receive all of the information. It's not like the information that you received is condensed. But, but there wouldn't be there wouldn't be an op opportunity for them for public uh, statements on each item, right? Yes, you know you could still do that, just like you do the consent resolution when you open in a public hearing. You can talk on item. B, C, D, E, or, e or F, yep. you would do the same thing on the consent. But to your point, it'd be agenda. one time for all those items. But also, if there's an item that in any way has anyone in the audience wishes mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. or is that, you pull yep. it right off the consent agenda, it goes back to the normal agenda. Yes. This is just to deal with those things that are... are you know, More routine in, in routine. nature and resolutions that yes. typically do not require you to have and there's two a ways. lot of discussion. There's two ways to think about it. There are some that would say, put all the first reading of, of ordinances on the consent agenda because it actually takes place the second. Others would say, no, the first is when we have a lot of the conversation. Those, though, that come up with the first that really have no issue and they're a no-brainer, put them on the consent agenda for the second. And you could, you could have a mixed bag. And so, as Christine said, you start slow on this because it, it's something that is a little bit unique and a little different. But once it gets going, it's actually very... Um, very efficient and it's done commonly throughout um, but you always have the ability to pull things off and you always have the ability to not do it if you don't want to be able to pull things out if we find it controversial or that yeah. concerned out correct yeah. my experience is any council member who has a problem with something the policy is to pull it out Absolutely. so it's not and even typically a you'll know that before where yeah. you'll obviously see the agenda uh, prior to that and you can say hey we're not gonna put that so or you pull it right at the meeting. You say yeah, we're switching sure. that to item to you know to item outside the consent because yeah, there's an agenda within the agenda. It's a part of. It's not the only agenda. Yeah. Agreed. Things can come up that we that aren't even written, right? So yeah, yeah. absolutely. So we'll notice during discussions and then want to pull yeah. it. Absolutely. absolutely. So this is just an effort to be more efficient. Yeah. Yes, and, and to to this end as well, um, I have talked to you before about the minutes and the, about our um, video presentations in the minutes being the permanent record. Our charter requires only the caption of what's dis discussed and what the vote was. And so when you move to also to a consent agenda, it tightens up your minutes too. There's, and they still have a video to go to to see. But as far as becoming a permanent record, um, they're much more precise, doesn't leave anything you don't put too, you end up not putting too much information in the minutes that would be up to interpretation. It's very succinct in what occurred. This, this was the issue, this was the vote, and you don't have, he said, she said. And a lot of trying. people refer back to the video now more than they do read the minutes. Exactly, and we keep those for a long time. The video is not our permanent record, the minutes are, but um, this also makes that a little bit more concise. We recognize it's a slow process. It's just a thought, but actually you've already doing the consent resolution, which means you already started grouping things. Now picture that consent resolution just being titled as a consent agenda, which includes those resolutions that are already there and maybe a couple other items. It could be, you know, an ordinance or two. It could even be, you know, something as a proclamation or something that you are giving out that you wanted on the in the minutes somehow, and you wanted a, a council action on it. There's a lot of different things you could do. As you think about this and consider it, uh, consider it. I'll be happy to send out links to other cities that utilize this if you want to be able to to see their agendas. I didn't go all out and put together a big packet, but yeah. um, many cities utilize this. So.
Christine, the other, the other, just another comment on this, this, you know, this, all these opportunities. You could also go to a situation where, um, assuming the resolution reading is absolute and resolutions have to be read, you could have the resolution reading pre-recorded, and so the resolution is already read, and you display it on the screen, and it's you know say okay, we'll have the reading of the resolution. And then it's, it's read. There's a lot of different things that different communities do. Some will have the city secretary or the city clerk read the resolutions. You don't have to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> there was one today. I Notice I said the off. city secretary or city <laughs> clerk. I didn't I say. Like, Here you go. Because <laughs> I, <laughs> and Jerry. Oh, uh, Jerry has. Well, and, yes, and Jerry was was correct. In most of the cities that um, have the consent agenda, the city secretary usually reads that. The, the difference being the captions of the resolutions and ordinances are read on a consent agenda. And so we reviewed our charter, and that would be passable. That would, so um, say I was, you had to read the entire agenda, and that's what, what you would read. Uh, consideration of resolution R22-2094, electing blah 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 consideration of but you wouldn't have to read all of the whereas's just like we do with the mayor. and i say you mayor keeping that in mind. No. Yeah. <laughs> no but truly really, you, yes you you could you could direct the city secretary to read that or as jerry said have it be pre pre-recorded and just have someone available in case. I wonder if she'd write them shorter if she had to read them. <laughs> That's why I said about the can. proclamations now. Uh, no, the proclamations are still yeah. pretty full. Cool. They're good. Okay. And then uh, the, the last item, consideration of summer attire. And I believe uh, the intent here is for mayor and council uh, and the public presentation that it makes of wearing certain shirts during the summer months, such as uh, an official Stars and Guitars shirt, patriotic shirt in July, something for our car show perhaps um, during the fall. GCISD back months. to school in the fall, something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and so that would also be something up for consideration. And that not being nearly the structure of a consent agenda item, if you want that move to uh, the resolution with the update of the rules of procedures um, on this resolution, we could certainly do that. Are you? I don't so think this is basically like a Because it's saying, uh, and, and more traditional shirts in the fall and winter, and we've got to wear what you provide for us. Is that what you're saying? Wearing uniform? No, in the fall, I'll just go back to traditional dress like okay. dress right now. Like our, the idea is, do you do something, you know, oh unique, God, a couple of meetings in the summer just because there's some reason to do that. And so okay. that's the thought process. You'll see councils, they'll all wear the, the same polo, 4th of July. They'll all wear like a red, white, and blue flag polo that has collie ball. One everywhere. challenge with that is, is the freezing rooms. <laughs> sure. uh, maybe for you. We have one temperature in this room and it's cold, so that's tough to fix. Well, and you actually wouldn't have to write that into your rules of procedure if it's something that you want to uh, consider and make a suggestion as the time comes around and you all. I'm fine if somebody wants to wear a polo or what have you. I don't want to wear a matching polo with everybody else. <laughs> the coat says with that. George, you know. They get us confused. We look That's a lot alike. Right. <laughs> there, so uh, that's a discussion. I think we just need to discuss that probably more. Okay. And, and for clarity, you want to move the council meetings to begin at 7, but do we want to choose a a time to really notify the public that we're moving to that, not just boom the yeah, next we meeting. Need some time to yeah, do we that. Need, yeah. So I'm thinking that maybe you, you pick a month that you yeah. want to start. That. It makes sense to do fiscal year October first type thing. Okay. If you're gonna if you're gonna do it, yeah. okay. you guys, what do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down, I sideways. I like it. Yeah. Okay, give me. Okay. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, mm -hmm. thumbs up, thumbs up. 
<laughs> George gives me the thumbs up too, so I'll get one also. Did anyone have any other thing that they felt like staff should address in, in the rules of procedure and any other changes? Uh, could you back up that okay. page before, please? Just real quick. Okay. Anybody else? Any other Bring concerns? forth a, a resolution at the next meeting. At the next one. And if we decide we want to move to a consent agenda, that's a future conversation we need to. I think probably we all will. Uh, I think you all would probably feel more comfortable having another work session dis no, discussion. I, agree. I, I don't think we're ready tonight. That's what I'm trying to understand. Right. Yes. And yeah. so, at your direction, I'll I'll bring forth whatever whatever you would like, whatever you would like to see, and we'll have another work session. Yeah, we can do that at, at the fiscal year as well. Yeah, we'll just discuss, discuss, discuss between. It's there. a phased in thing, no doubt. Okay. You know, I've been through it three or four times, and it's pretty impressive. We're all very anxious going into it, and then when it's in place, we're all like, oh, this is second nature. But it is a transition. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Thank Anything you. Else? Uh, thank you, Ms. Christine. The other uh, work session is discussion of the July 6, 2022 City Council regular agenda items. Anybody got any questions or discussions on that? Okay. Well, the, with that, then I'm going to close the work session at 6.47. And then I'll go into executive session. The meeting will now come to order on July 6, 2022 at 6.47 p.m. And I will call the roll. I don't really have to call the roll. We are all, all here. We will be moving into executive session in accordance with the Texas Governance Code, Chapter 551, Subchapter D, Section 551. Point zero seven one legal section five five one point zero seven two real estate section five five one point zero seven four personnel and section five five one point zero eight seven economic de development for executive session. That's good to pass.